Good morning, happy Tuesday, PASW staff, clients and our friends joining us weekly. Um, hope you enjoyed Lady and the Tramp. That was, uh, it's pretty uh, romantic, lovely scene. So get something into me today, that would be great. Um, doesn't have to have lyrics, doesn't have to be Italian, but it should be, you know, romantic dinner music in that realm of something like that. Um, not the Beach Boys or something. So uh, you guys know the drill, and if you're new, please just you know text me and send me stuff and some ideas. I'm here to work with you guys, and as we know, very generously, there's a there's a monthly prize. So um, each week, almost not a class goes by without me men mentioning Scott Joplin, and I didn't know how I always liked his music. Not until we did our class together did I think about his importance. Um, not just like I like the music, but how important he was in the evolution of all the music that we talk about. You know, I mean, last week was Miles Davis with jazz. Then we did classical music, you know, and so some of these advanced classes, which we're going to talk about tomorrow, um, have helped a lot. And Joplin is a name and a person that comes up all the time. So we're going to review Scott Joplin's life today and music today with uh, a class. Pre -recorded, uh, previously recorded class that, that we've seen because we need review. We want to show you guys where he came from and how he started. Then tomorrow we're going to take a step back and think about how did Joplin get there because I it's driving me crazy. I have to know, I have to see the trajectory. We have to together. So tomorrow we're going we're gonna to dive into, we're going to back up and dive into how he got to that ragtime feel. So l lest anyone think we're going to be at Disneyland today, we won't. We will be hearing ragtime music that's very, it's just so fun. It puts you in such a great mood. Hopefully you'll be put in a good mood too. Today we'll be talking about the American composer and pianist Scott Joplin. Joplin was dubbed the king of ragtime, so we'll look at what ragtime is. When you hear it, you'll you'll know what it is. But ragtime is really um, a precursor to jazz, and it's a hybrid of classical music and uh, African American folk music. Which one could say that that is what jazz came to be. So we're going to look at Scott Joplin's life and music, um, and this is the late 19th century. So this is before jazz is and Dixieland is sort of invented you know this is like 10 20 years prior to that you know prior to louis armstrong and all the people that we know so we're going to look at the transition 20th century was so interesting in so many ways that turn of the century of so many inventions being made and but in particular music it became so much freer and um one of those freedoms is jazz and before that is ragtime so we're gonna look at ragtime so uh we'll definitely have too much fun today so we'll just try to contain ourselves we're gonna learn about scott joplin learn about ragtime learn about um uh you know yeah you know so let's uh let's dive into um a little bit about first we'll we'll talk about you know rag ragtime and then we'll look at his life so the, the term is kind of, it kind of originally was like ragged plain. So ragged means not, you know, this is not ragged. This is kind of ragged, right? And you'll hear that even though it can sound smooth, the left hand of the piano is playing the chords and the bass line, while the right hand is playing the melody. So uh, he comes up with this kind of, along with a few other composers, but he's the most famous, just mostly because of the songs he's written, and you'll recognize some of the songs. So Ragtime has this rhythmic drive and this syncopation with it, um, and you can hear that um, in, in these pieces. So uh, let's, let's talk about his early life, because he, he had an interesting life. It, it, most people think he was born around 1868, right around that that part it's not really well known because there wasn't there weren't any documents back then especially for blacks you know unfortunately and uh, his dad was an ex-slave so this is if we think about this is sort of right around when slavery ended quote unquote ended i mean um but so his dad was an ex-slave but he was a musician he, he he played violin and would play uh for plantation parties in north carolina and his mother was a singer and played banjo so he was giving given musical lessons by his family at the age of seven 
and um, his mom would clean houses while he would play the piano in exchange for they would let him use their piano and she would clean their house. So, um, and this is all in Texas or Arkansas. Scholars are, are not really sure about where, but you know, definitely in the South. Definitely some place we don't ever want to go to, right? I'm just kidding. Um, and so he starts, he finds this teacher, this Jewish, um, German American born teacher that moves to the South and to Texas in 18, in the late 1860s. And at the age of 11, he starts taking lessons with this guy, uh, Julius Weiss. Julius Weiss had a huge influence on him and he taught him free of charge, uh, cause he saw so much potential and talent in Scott Joplin and he knew he didn't have any money, but he introduced him to a whole wide range of music and, and taught him harmony and theory and music like Chopin and taught him about classical music. And that's where he got his training at a young, young age in classical music. He also introduced him to polka music. And if we think of polka music, polka has a real rhythmic sensibility to it. And so we're, we're kind of wondering that, or um, not wondering, we are kind of thinking about early jazz, right? Early 20th century music, because not only jazz, but if we think of European classical music, right? You have the 19th century, we have Chopin, we have Tchaikovsky. We haven't looked at Chopin, but I mean, we've looked at Tchaikovsky and other romantic composers. So we have this European romantic music going on in the late 19th century. Then we have Scott Joplin, and we have, with the end of slavery, we have um, this really great African-American folk music going on. And he's blending this. He's hearing, he's hearing music in, in Europe and he's also hearing his music that his parents are playing and people are playing around him. And he's, he's blending this into, and you know, we'll never understand, and, and, but we're just trying to figure out what, and, and then his piano teacher also introduces polka to him. So he's taking in all these things of music, uh, all these different styles, and he's becoming, he's creating his own style. I mean, Joplin was a genius. I mean, this guy was so ahead of his time and set the foundation for, for American music. I mean, when you think of, we all, jazz and ragtime, they're truly an American art form, which is really cool to say that, for us to say that, that our country, you know, um, you know, not invented it, but we can go with that. I mean, I, I kind of think so. So the teacher is really, and he's faithful and loyal to this guy the rest of his life and would give him money and um, would take care of him. Uh, he would just Scott Joplin with Julius Weiss later. So that's kind of cool. So um, the Chicago World Fair happens in 1893. And this is a huge World Fair uh, celebrating, you know, the beginning of, Amer uh, you know, Columbus's voyage to America 400 years later. And um, he gets a band together and he's playing cornet at this time. So he's playing you know, trumpet, which the cornet's a smaller trumpet. So he's playing these um, piano and cornet. Not at the same time, but, um, uh, and he gets a little group together. They play at the World Fair, and, and people start taking notice of this kind of new music, this up, up tempo classical music, if you will. Um, that's, you know, if we just put it in simple terms, you know, it's, it, he's taking European harmonies and waltzes or whatever, and then just simply putting kind of a beat to it, a rhythm, a pulse or something. Um, and they, he gets some attention there, and, um, uh, there's this little like prank that these train conductors pull somewhere in the south, and um, it's it was and so he writes this march based on th what happened. It, it, it's like they made these two trains collide as I don't know entertainment. I mean, people had nothing to do back then, but it, it wasn't like an accident, but it, it was a planned accident. But when he 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 witnessed this, and when he saw this these trains going by, he he got inspired by, and he wrote one of his first ragtime um, uh, great crush collision march, <laughs> and um, that's what we're hearing right now. This is one of his early pieces. You can see that, and like. Um, like Meredith Wilson, who we talked about in The Music Man, that opening scene of the train, chicka, chicka, chicka. Scott Joplin's using, seeing the train as a rhythmic um, device in music. So we could make that kind of connection, perhaps. Uh, 
And so with these with this first train march that he writes, he's starting to find his this new way of writing music, um, which is really cool. So uh, after that, Joplin moves to Missouri and he begins publishing his own music and begins uh, and composes the most famous song, probably Maple Leaf Rag in 1899. This brought him tremendous fame and wealth too. Uh, and for a black band at that time for, to get recognition, fame and wealth was so uh, truly amazing. Um, and so as you can hear, there's kind of stride piano, left hand piano, it's so hard to play. It's, it's so fun and it sounds so easy. Um, and really he was more of a composer than a pianist. They said that he was kind of a mediocre pianist actually. So. Um, doesn't matter he wrote you know it's really about the writing but i didn't kind of know that so uh maple leaf rag in 1899 and then a few years later in 1902 he writes the entertainer which is almost just as famous this was back when they kind of had the, the player pianos and player piano you've probably seen that at you know, Western, uh, you know, Knott's Berry Farm or something like that where they, it's like a self-playing piano and you can, you can put in, you can program little notes on, on a piece of paper and you put it in the piano and it, so, and it sound, it has that kind of like cowboy saloonish sound. It's kind of like early MIDI recording if we think of it now, but um, that's, that's kind of the ragtime feel. and. It was probably very hard to play, so with if they made a player piano do it, they could they could speed it up and I don't know, you know, make it faster. So Joplin considered his rags not not really jazz like in the sense that they weren't they were they were supposed to be played exactly how it was written, just like a classical piece. And he elevated this kind of saloon playing music to a real art form. And his teacher said, uh, Julius Weiss said that you know. You, the music should be entertaining, but it should also be artistic as well. If you can have art and entertainment together, then that's, that's, and we've talked about that. It's good to be, to appeal to as many people as you can, but also to maintain that artistic integrity too. You know, we think of the Beatles and they were so entertaining to listen to, but then there was something, an, another level that was going on that was very brilliant and artistic too. And if you can get both of those together, then you have the formula. Um, so his, that was good advice. But he, he elevates this kind of jazz saloon, early jazz saloon ragtime, um, you know, that you would play in like bordellos or something like that or, or um, cat houses. And uh, he, he went, he wanted it to be more in the mainstream and not considered a low art form or something like that, which is ridiculous because it's, it's, a, it's a very a brilliant art form and very sophisticated in a fun way. So, yeah. Um, and then not only he writes these beautiful, soft, sensitive songs as well. I mean, you know, we hear the, the kind of, not mechanical, but a little mechanical, you know, left hand stride chords with Maple Leaf and Entertainer. But then he'll go on to write something like Bethina, which he just uh, wrote for um, his wife uh, after his wife's death. His wife's name was Freddie. I, I, I don't not sure what that is, but regardless, um, he writes these gorgeous, this is a gorgeous waltz, so melancholy. He has such a heart in a lot of his music, so it's not just, you know, play this as fast as you can. He has such, and then when he comes out a few years later with Solace, which is this Mexican serenade, it's just, it's so, uh, this is 1909. So this is really early. I mean, for in terms of I mean, this, you know, 1909, I mean, people, it was like the Wild West here in, in L.A., but I don't know why I said L.A., because this has nothing to do with L.A., but I mean, just the country. Um, yeah, so this piece is one of my favorite pieces, and we're listening to a recording that maybe is the most famous recording 
of um, Isaac Perlman on violin and Andre Previn on piano, and they did this wonderful album of all of Joplin's work. And even though Joplin didn't score it for violin and piano, I think that what they created on this album together in the 80s or so um, was is the best album for Joplin's music. And um, so after after you know he moves to New York after Missouri, he moves to New York and tries to get his operas produced because he, he wants to keep going um, in this, you know, grand way. And, but he spends a lot of his own money, and, and he ends up broke, and nobody wants to put on the opera. And, he, you know, it's another kind of sad story. And, and he gets very depressed, and, um, and he's suffering from syphilis at this time, and he ends up in a, in a mental institution in, in New York. And... Um, and uh, dies at age 48 and, um, of syphilis and dementia and, and so much great music in his heart. And he influenced a lot of people while he was alive, um, including Claude Debussy. Debussy loved his music and was influenced by this ragtime going on. So European composers were taking note, notice of, you know, this black guy playing this great music in the South. Not only Debussy, Eric Satie from Paris was taking notice, and Igor Stravinsky in Russia, or, you know, in Russia, and he was in France. Um, so these European composers are taking notice of, of this guy playing while he's still alive. Um, and he was really famous and very wealthy during that time. So he was just a, a tremendous talent. And, and Scott Joplin love his music it just always puts me in a good mood my aunt is a great piano player and she'd always play his ragtime music um when i'd go over the house and i was just like this is fun you know this is just so i remember her playing pineapple rag and she might be watching this so auntie thank you very much for playing this wonderful music when i listened to it as a kid i just i i just thought it was so fun and then as an adult, you just realize, oh my gosh, like that was fun. And it still holds up this great music. So, um, uh, but you know, in the seventies, George Roy Hill, the director, um, comes out with The Sting in 1973. And The Sting is a great movie. It's so great, but he uses all Scott Joplin music. And uh, that's with, um, you know, Paul Newman and uh, Robert Redford. So you should check out that movie. So uh, in the seventies, he kind of gets a revival of his music going. Um, but yeah, what a wonderful composer, pianist, and uh, and everything. So, um, okay, hope you enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun t telling you guys about this. So I hope you enjoyed that earlier Scott Joplin lecture or class. Um, it's such fun music, right? I mean, it puts a smile on your face. It does seem like Disneyland music. It's just happy. It's vibrant. It's uh, The rhythm is great, and the melodies live on. The sensitive you know, um, solace piece. So he wasn't just a fast playing piano man. He was, you know, a very serious composer. I mean, thank God for that teacher, Julius Weiss. I, I've been thinking about that guy. I mean, he, he just found the right teacher and he, and he taught him for free, which is really cool. And he took care of him later in life. Cause so sometimes it just takes, um, one person. You don't need the whole world to love you. Just maybe one person to, notice hey you're you got a big talent and then let me expose you to this and when you expose when you're exposed to something you end up changing the world possibly so i thought that was really really great so think about scott joplin think about ragtime and we're going to go in tomorrow and look at how he came how that style came to be with scott joplin so um lots to think about but still make sure you enjoy your day too okay um see you tomorrow bye <music>